There's a lot of information out there about nuclear weapons as election cycle. So this season on Nuke Talk, we'll talk about the nuclear ballot, how the U.S. election shapes nuclear policy. Understanding nuclear policy is vital, particularly with so much on the line this election cycle. But we won't tell you which candidate to vote for. This season, however, we will have a number of brilliant guests who will discuss nuclear policy in depth, as well as the impact of the U.S. presidential election and its results. The president, senators, Congress people, and others appointed to serve have implications on both domestic and foreign policy when it comes to nuclear weapons issues. So, by the end of this season, hopefully you'll have a better understanding of what's at stake when it comes to nuclear weapons this cycle. So let's get started. Today, we're starting with the president. Starting small, obviously. The U.S. president is the only person with the authority to launch any of the roughly 3,700 nuclear weapons in the U.S. arsenal, an arsenal that could wipe out all human life many times over. Once they decide to go nuclear, there is no other person in the United States government that can act as a check or a balance. The president must rely upon their prudence and steady nerves to make a decision that could alter the course of human history. It is almost unfathomable that one person should have to make such a consequential decision in 15 minutes or less. And much of the policies that are put in place for a situation of that magnitude are planned out in a document called the Nuclear Posture Review, or known by its shorthand, NPR not to be mistaken by the radio station. And to learn more about the Nuclear Posture Review, we will be joined by someone who has worked on one. My name is David Kern. I'm an associate professor at St. John's University in the Government and Politics Department. Currently, and have been for the last year, a visiting scholar at the Managing the Atom Project and the International Security Program at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School. I think one of the relatively useful bullet points for this discussion is that I was able to work on what became the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review when I was a strategic advisor for countering weapons of mass destruction in OSD policy during the 2016-2017 year. So in short, what is a nuclear posture review? I think the best way to think about it in a straightforward way is simply that it is an encapsulation of each president's vision of the role of nuclear weapons and what U.S. nuclear weapons strategy and policy will be during their administration, and really the prioritization of different aspects of nuclear weapons policy. So thinking about how we would potentially target these things, how we would potentially respond to adversaries in terms of deterring bad guys versus reassuring allies, things like force structure, the relative importance of strategic arms control, as well as non-proliferation and the directives to the larger nuclear weapons complex, or what we would call the nuclear enterprise, which maintains, builds, modernizes the arsenal. So both the strategic central arsenal made up of the triad, as well as potential additional theater or tactical nuclear weapons programs. And each nuclear posture review tries to address the challenges of the security environment by trying to define and outline the role of nuclear weapons within the U.S. national security strategy, which is no small feat. So what is the process to create this document? I can only speak to my experience. I think that if you look at the histories of previous ones, you know, one of the complaints about the 92-93 one was Ash Carter playing the central role, bringing in people from the outside. The services kind of, you know, the Joint Chiefs were not thrilled, I guess, in, with the way that was done. The, 2010, what ended up being the 2010, I think that the nature of the Prague agenda meant that the deputies involved in the kind of strategic systems or what was called the old NMD office worked closely with the CWMD office. And so there was kind of a partnership there. Although there's always going to be kind of back and forths on this, and that, as you would expect, I can say that the process that I was a part of was fairly open 
And our leadership, at least in the CWMD office, one of the priorities that we were tasked with was to try to make sure that anyone who had equities in the, you know, the nuclear enterprise had someone at the table if they wanted to be there. We worked really closely with our joint staff partners. We worked really closely with the folks in the nuclear and missile defense office. And so we had some really big, we worked very closely with our colleagues at state. And so we would have kind of these big, what were actually really fun, interesting, big meetings. Some people on Zoom, some people we had to get, you know, a couple of times we actually had to get bigger spaces because more people showed up. But then we also had a process where, you know, we a few of the more senior folks would engage at the NSC level. It was a relatively inclusive process. And I think that it was actually relatively well run and well managed. And I think despite the fact that we knew, for example, that the priorities that our office and which had been previously kind of had the light shined on it in the previous NPR, we knew that probably wasn't going to be the case precisely because of the nature of the security environment changing. The document itself still ends up being relatively, it's a reflection of the entire bureaucratic apparatus with regard to nuclear weapons. The Nuclear Posture Review frequently mirrors the security environment of the moment which shapes the president's approach to nuclear weapons policy. It's crucial to analyze how each administration's NPR approached transparency and policy and how that impacted the perceptions by both allies and adversaries regarding U.S. nuclear strategy. And this is evident in whether they signal a commitment to arms control negotiations or conversely, a focus on modernizing the U.S. nuclear arsenal. Well, I think ultimately what those meetings end up being about and as it goes up the chain of seniority to principles and the voices that really have the way to define policy and adjudicate between some of the trade-offs that inevitably come up. How much do you want to continue to signal that you're open to arms control? So the Biden administration wanted a follow-on to the New START Treaty. There was an explicit discussion of trying to engage China in what's called a strategic stability dialogue. There's a lot, I mean, there continues to be a lot of track to discussions with China. They've been reticent about engaging in anything formal and continue to... Their position of, we're not in the same league as you and Russia, is one that they continue to stand by. It's increasingly difficult, I think, for the U.S. and our allies and partners to accept, and it's not necessarily constructive. But that was explicitly made in the Biden NPR. So these are the types of I would say for thinking about like the next NPR, these are the types of things that you have to think about prioritizing. If you're going to spend most of the time talking about deterrent, 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 deterrent of X, deterrent of Y, deterrent of Z, and capability A, capability B, capability C, that's going to be interpreted by adversaries and allies alike. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to articulate policies that both maximize the perceived credibility of your deterrent, you're trying to maximize at the same time the reassurance value to allies, letting them know that we have their backs no matter what, and we will be there no matter what. And then questions of is arms control possible and if possible, how do we get there? How important is non-proliferation? Right? And this is something that I think is actually one of the things that's going to be really tough in the next one, which is despite the fact that even the Trump NPR maintained U.S. commitments to nonproliferation, there's the nature of the security environment may make those commitments harder. And how much you articulate a commitment to one versus the other can be really difficult. Striking that balance can be difficult. In light of this perspective on deterrence and the importance of political commitments, it's crucial to explore how the formal strategies outlined in the NPR and other policy documents reflect and reinforce this perception of credibility. So how does the articulation of these strategies alongside tangible actions and international agreements shape the overall effectiveness and reliability of deterrence guarantees? And this is where I diverge from some of my colleagues that are advocating for new and more diverse capabilities. Ultimately, at the end of the day, deterrence is a psychological relationship between an adver- two adversaries. 
And it's whether they believe that adversary A believes that adversary B will maintain its commitment to state C. So with regard to the types of capabilities we have, the investment, the deployment, the articulation of a willingness to use in documents like the NPR is certainly part of it. And if you don't have capabilities to threaten and to be able to actually deliver the threatened damage or harm, then it's not going to be a credible threat. But at the same time, what I think a lot of colleagues miss, particularly the ones that are always that leap to say that we need more and different stuff, is that it's still about political commitment. And those political commitments are they're in some ways they're intangible because it's a belief in a relationship it's a perception and and these things are built on perception but perceptions can be enhanced the credibility of a deterrent can the perception of its credibility can be enhanced by things like formal treaties uh, security partnerships deployment of troops right think about a tripwire deployment what does a tripwire deployment entail well it entails a few of your troops being with the allies troops and what it means that on day one if an adversary was to do something bad chances are u.s troops are going to die that's an enormously powerful signal that we will be there and we will follow through now again geography and technology can make these things more difficult like defending the baltics may be more difficult than defending germany etc but the key point being is that the messaging of a president, the messaging of a Congress, the messaging of popular opinion, these things are all critical to the underlying notion of the credibility of a deterrent guarantee. The actions and policies of the United States and nuclear strategy significantly impact how our allies perceive our reliability and commitments. When the U.S. demonstrates a strong stance, whether through robust arms control agreements, modernization efforts, or strategic deployments, this can either bolster or undermine the confidence our allies have in the United States. Active engagement in arms control and adherence to non-proliferation commitments can enhance trust and solidarity among allied nations, reinforcing their belief in the United States' dedication to global security. Conversely, a focus on modernizing the nuclear arsenal without addressing arms control might raise concerns about an arms race or a shift in strategic priorities, potentially affecting allied nations' security strategies and their trust in U.S. commitments. So the nuclear umbrella is as strong as having the capabilities to carry out the types of things that you threaten in return if indeed an adversary was to carry out aggression, carry out provocative behavior, etc. If it was to do something that you have told them not to do, it's how much you can make the adversary believe that you will be there. So again, I think what this ties back to is a simple case that we have a candidate for president who has consistently undermined alliances, has called into question their value, has disparaged the utility or the contributions that they make. I understand that folks supporting him will say that, well, he was just doing it to get them to pony up. I fundamentally disagree. And having worked with allies during the period of time, I know that that's not how the allies were seeing it on a kind of personal level. So again, it's no amount to tie this up in a bow. No amount of capabilities can overcome a perceived lack of commitment. So if it's capabilities plus commitment equals level of deterrence, having a very weak commitment with all the capabilities in the world is often a very weak deterrent bordering on a bluff. And so I don't think that Japan or Korea should feel that we wouldn't be there for them, certainly under this administration. And if the party in the White House was to stay in the White House, I think in a different administration, yes, you would have questions. With Taiwan, I think the fundamental problem is we don't have the political relationship with Taiwan, the foundation to threaten, for example, tactical nuclear use. It's, I mean, it's not there. And ultimately, I would argue that in a perverse way, it undermines our guarantee to countries like Japan and South Korea that we would use nuclear weapons in a situation that isn't defending them, but is we think that they have the same interests that we do. And it, in some ways, it cheapens the guarantee that we make to them. 
that's supposed to be automatic. We're there day one, as long as it takes. And so that's what I think is problematic about the nuclear umbrella takes a long time to build and the credibility is not simply about capability and it can take a relatively short period to kind of poke holes in. That's a damaging thing that can be hard to get back. Given that the credibility of the nuclear umbrella depends not only on the actual capabilities, but also on the perceived commitment to defend allies, it's crucial to consider how various external factors might undermine this trust. External influences, such as public statements, media portrayals, and actions taken by non-governmental actors can profoundly affect how allies perceive the reliability of U.S. nuclear guarantees. In order to maintain a credible and reliable nuclear umbrella, it is essential to understand the broader context in which these perceptions are shaped, including the role of external actors and public discourse. The heritage piece talks about modernizing the triad with some is the word meager or moderate expansions to the triad, but then significant expansions of non-strategic nuclear weapons, meaning tactical and theater. And I think the, I did the math and I think they'd like to build almost five or 600 new tactical systems. That's fair enough. The question is, where does the money come from? And I think that we're living in this unreality of we're approaching a trillion dollar defense budget and it is one area in the times that we live in where democrats and republicans seem to agree but i would argue that those programs are only making the conventional system the conventional balance the conventional systems we need harder to procure and will undermine our ability to rectify the imbalance in conventional forces, the forces that I would submit are most important because to an adversary, there's little question that we would hesitate to use them. Now, the way we use them, particularly in a Taiwan situation that we don't have to talk about because there are certain, certainly there's potential for escalation, etc. But the idea that we would simply rely on nuclear weapons more, that's certainly a choice and there's a historical precedent the shipbuilding program in the in the united states right now is, is facing significant challenges in nuclear powered not nuclear armed but nuclear powered attack subs are probably one of the most useful platforms we have in a contingency in the western pacific the b21 program sounds like it's doing well but we don't really know what the numbers are and it comes back to this question that i would submit to my colleagues who are calling for all sorts of new fun stuff where is it going to come from because one outside of paying for it the most apparent fact of u.s national security life today is that our industrial base is in a real difficult spot and between the industrial base and the nuclear enterprise who are responsible for the production of plutonium pits building new warheads building the systems by the way the idea of testing new weapons has been introduced which would move us far away from the comprehensive test ban treaty etc but those two national fundamental kind of national assets are in really tough shape in what a lot of the, whether it's the Strategic Posture Commission, whether it's the Heritage Report, whether it's Project 2025, they seem to assume an industrial base. And, and we can't assume an industrial base because the one we have is not capable of building a massive menu of programs over the next five to 10 years. So whether we want to or not, I would argue that the responsible thing is to prioritize another just as a side issue, heritage and the strategic posture review, both just throw in that we should have a massive expansion of our ballistic missile defense capabilities. They acknowledge the fact that China probably has hypersonic strategic glide vehicles that can carry nuclear weapons that would make any such system useless, but still believe that we should invest in both more interceptors, an architecture in space that, by the way, would cause potential problems with the Outer Space Treaty if they wanted to start putting kinetic things up there. But then finally, multiple sites within the United States, all of which are expensive, have had a horrendous track record over the course of 60 years in this country, if not longer, and again, are cost ineffective to the threats that we face. So 
it's really difficult to see. You're proposing a buildup that you know is virtually impossible to actually achieve in any meaningful way, which I don't know how that really helps any of us. Given all of that, and considering that nuclear weapons are unlikely to be eliminated in our lifetime, the question of sole authority is an important one. Sole authority means that the, only the U.S. president has the authority to launch any of the roughly 3,700 nuclear weapons in the U.S. arsenal. Only they decide to go nuclear. There is no one else in the U.S. government who can act as a check or balance. And in 15 minutes or less, one person must make such a consequential decision. So what do we need to know about sole authority? We are fortunate to be joined by Mackenzie Knight from the Federation of American Scientists. You might know FAS from their nuclear notebook, which Mackenzie co-authors. Hi, my name is Mackenzie Knight. I'm a senior research associate on the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. So I do open source research and analysis on global nuclear forces and nuclear trends and policies. So what is sole authority and what are some common misperceptions about it? So when we talk about sole authority in the context of nuclear weapons, what we mean is that the president of the United States is the one person who has the legal authority to order the launch of nuclear weapons. So right now, as we speak, that person is President Joe Biden. And no other U.S. official has that power. And the president is not legally required to consult with anyone or receive anybody else's approval before ordering nuclear use. So that's what we mean by sole authority. And some common misperceptions about it. The first, I think, is just that there's, that the way it works is that like there's this big red button in like the Oval Office that the president can just like hit if they want to launch some nuclear weapons. So that's not the way it works. But I think that's kind of more of like a, a symbolism of the power the president holds, you know, effectively at the touch of his hand, the president can order the launch of nuclear weapons. Another common misconception is that the Secretary of Defense or the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff are part of the chain of command to carry out a nuclear launch order. And that is also not true. So like I said before, the, the president is the only person who is required to be in the process of ordering the launch of a nuclear weapon. And the president can choose to consult the Secretary of Defense or the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff if they so choose, but they are not required to do so. And then one more common misconception that I think is important to point out is that I think a lot of people, when confronted with the reality of presidential sole authority, fall back on this, this idea that, well, missile launch officers could just decide to not launch the nuclear weapon. And that can be kind of a, a safeguard from a president, you know, ordering a launch that might not be the right decision. But Unfortunately, that's also not the way that it works. They have baked redundancy into the system. So if a president orders the launch of ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, the order goes to five missile crews and only two missile crew votes are required in order for that launch to be carried out. So three of them could decide to defy the president's order and the launch would still happen. Media portrayals often exaggerate or fictionalize the concept of sole authority in nuclear decision-making, which does not reflect the actual reality. These depictions frequently overlook the fact that there are few safeguards actually put in place. I think it's important to also distinguish between a president ordering the launch of nuclear weapons in a situation when the U.S. is under imminent attack by another country's nuclear weapons versus the president deciding to use nuclear weapons in a first use case. And part of the kind of safeguards that are in place for this system are, we have early warning systems, very sophisticated early warning systems throughout the US, like satellites and radars and other things like that, to identify whether an incoming attack is happening. And typically, those systems will identify an incoming attack and the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff will be alerted to this attack and they will have like an emergency conference with the president to give the president their assessment of the situation and then let the president know what their options are. 
And I think that that can be both a safeguard, but also pose a little bit of a risk because we have these systems that can say, here's what's happening. But also that's not always a foolproof method of knowing exactly what is coming and if it is a nuclear attack or not. So all of these systems can do is say, there's a missile on the way, but they can't necessarily say that is a missile with nuclear weapons on it or that was a missile that was intentionally launched by a nuclear adversary, and we don't know quite yet exactly where it's going to hit. And because of that, it can kind of push the president to make a decision before they have all of the information. And especially because we have this, you know, kind of rushed policy of use it or lose it with our nuclear missiles, where if, the president is told, hey, this incoming attack might be on its way to take out our missiles. We need to launch them quickly before they're destroyed or before this attack hits the White House or something like that. And because of that, the president has, many experts say, less than 10 minutes to make a decision once they are notified that an attack is on its way. So there are some safeguards in place and some structure to how this works. There are actually certain situations and certain pieces of this process that push a president towards making a decision to launch nuclear weapons. Both allies and adversaries realize that the U.S. president is the only and final decision maker when it comes to the use of U.S. nuclear weapons, which has international implications. The concept of sole authority is a really important consideration when we're thinking about ally management and also adversary management as well. So individual presidents can have very different impacts on U.S. relationships with allies and adversaries. If a current U.S. president has degraded relations with a very strong U.S. ally historically, like let's say South Korea, if South Korea, because of whoever the current U.S. president is, no longer trusts that the U.S. president will make the right decisions to protect them from North Korean nuclear weapons or Chinese nuclear weapons and no longer has a strong relationship with the U.S. because of who the sitting president is, then they could decide that they need their own nuclear weapons to protect themselves. If they don't trust that the U.S. will protect them, then they want to develop the means to protect themselves. And that's something that has been talked about by certain South Korean and also Japanese officials. And so it's really important when you have a policy in the United States where the president is solely in charge of the U.S. nuclear arsenal and its use, that president maintains very strong communicative relationships with our allies. And on the other hand, this can also impact relationships with adversaries as well, because if an adversary views a current president as unstable or irrational, or if that current U.S. president is making inflammatory nuclear threats, it can very easily lead to a situation of high tension between the two countries that increases the risk of a nuclear exchange happening. And if there's such a relationship with an adversary who doesn't yet have nuclear weapons, that same dynamic could drive that country to desire nuclear weapons to protect themselves from a unstable, irrational U.S. leader who's in charge of nuclear weapons. So sole authority has a big impact on the international stage because it requires faith in who this one leader is by both allies and adversaries. When it comes to nuclear weapons, specifically the decision to use one, this trust in the U.S. president is crucial. A concept like sole authority will therefore affect public perception and trust at a time like an election season, when competency and steadiness are often discussed in a candidate. I think that sole authority has a big impact on people's perceptions of faith in their leaders. And, you know, maybe that's just me saying that as somebody who works in this field, I like to think that this is something on people's minds. Maybe it's not as much as I think it is, but I believe that people are aware going into an election, or at least I hope they are aware that whoever they are voting for, they are voting for who will have the sole authority over the U.S. nuclear arsenal. and. 
We actually, we have examples in the past of the American public being concerned about who has the power over the U.S. nuclear arsenal. So there was actually a poll done by Rethink Media in 2019 that showed that once informed about sole authority and how it works, nearly 80% of Americans were concerned about President Trump holding that power. And so I think that it has it has a very clear and real impact on people's trust in the president and how our systems work. I think that we also saw this very starkly during the Trump past Trump administration when General Mark Milley tried to step in and say any order by the president to launch nuclear weapons needs to be run by me first. And that was a very valiant attempt at putting a check on the process, but Mark Milley didn't have the legal authority to do that. And I think it forced people to to realize and to learn that there's actually very little that can be done to stop a president from launching nuclear weapons if they want to do so. And not only is there little that can be done to stop a president from launching a nuclear weapon, given the current security landscape, there's always a likelihood of a false alarm. It happens more than you think. One example is how on January 13th, 2018, at 8.08 a.m. Hawaii time, a false ballistic missile alert was issued, instructing residents of Hawaii to seek shelter and stating, this is not a drill. The alert was sent by mistake during a drill at the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. It took 38 minutes and 13 seconds for officials to correct the mistake. And during that time, residents thought that they were under a nuclear attack. A false alarm is absolutely a possibility under this system, and it's something that has happened in the past. There was even a situation where, at one point, a simulation disk got uploaded accidentally onto a computer at the nuclear command center that caused some people to think the U.S. was under a massive imminent attack. And it was a computer disk that was a simulation exercise for the nuclear forces. And somehow, some way, it got accidentally uploaded. And thankfully, in this situation, that was identified right before the president was notified that an incoming attack was happening. But we're not going to get lucky every single time. And there could be many other freak accidents like that in the future. And, you know, part of nuclear modernization is also modernizing nuclear command and control systems to try to prevent things like cyber attacks from happening. But it's not a foolproof system. And there will always be the potential for something like a freakish accident like that happening, but also just a miscalculation or a misunderstanding. We, in the past, there was also a time when India accidentally launched a missile into Pakistan and Pakistan thought, hey, is this a nuclear missile? We're actually not really sure. Could be a nuclear missile. And it was an accidental launch. And thankfully it did turn out to be a conventional missile, but Pakistan for several minutes didn't know if a nuclear missile was on its way. And there was a breakdown in communication between Indian and Pakistani officials. And Indian officials weren't able to tell Pakistani officials right away, hey, sorry about that, don't worry, you are not under nuclear attack. And there are so many situations like this that can happen that can, by a misunderstanding, now, 10 minutes later, the president has ordered the launch of nuclear weapons. And it's definitely a, a huge concern. It's hard to even imagine the realm of possibilities of all of the different accidents and miscalculations that could happen, but the possibility is 100% there. Understanding the risk associated with sole authority and the potential for miscalculation underscores the importance of clear and accurate communication about nuclear weapons. The media coverage of nuclear weapons in this election cycle is back at the forefront. Given that former President Donald Trump is running under the Republican ticket, it is well known that Trump was confrontational in dealing with other nuclear powers during his time in office. 
and he was openly skeptical of alliances based on nuclear guarantees provided by the United States. And there are still questions about whether Vice President Harris will be following Biden's nuclear policies or will she be shaping her own? The nuclear landscape today is possibly more contentious than ever. The risk of nuclear escalation in Ukraine has not lessened since Putin's invasion in 2022. And while North Korea continues to conduct military drills and tests the possibility of another nuclear test on the Korean peninsula, this has sparked discussion about South Korea developing its own nuclear arsenal, especially given the upcoming US presidential election when nuclear umbrellas and commitments remain unclear. So today we have the editor and writer from the New York Times at the Brink series. I'm Katie Kingsbury, and I'm the editorial page editor at the New York Times, where I oversee the Opinion Report. I'm Bill Hennigan. I write on national security issues for the Opinion section at the New York Times. The At the Brink series, which premiered earlier this year, is highly relevant amid current global nuclear concerns. It has significantly influenced media portrayals of nuclear issues, enhancing public understanding and guiding more informed discussion on nuclear policy and security. So. We didn't necessarily know it at the time, but this project really started for me in the fall of 2022. You'll probably remember that was a moment when Putin was threatening to use a tactical nuclear weapon. And Bill and I had the opportunity to travel to Seoul, South Korea, where the city was on edge and everyone we spoke to was talking about the possibility of a seventh atomic test by North Korea. And it was not an issue that I necessarily knew a lot about at the time. Bill, of course, has been an expert for many, many years. And what it occurred to me was that millions of people were living in fear of a rogue nation when it comes to North Korea. And then, of course, in Europe at the same time as Putin is making his threats. And so and the more I learned about it, the more I felt like we're seeing the buildup of the arsenals in China as well. And one of the consistent themes that fall and into the next year was the threat of China and the fact that the United States should prepare for a military engagement with China. And so the more I learned, the more I realized that the American public needed to know more and really citizens across the globe needed to understand more. We were really lucky we were able to secure some philanthropic funding from the Outrider Foundation as well as the Carnegie Foundation and Prospect Hill. And we were able to hire Bill to come to the Times to work on this series. And then we spent several months walking through the process of pulling together that first piece, which we called The Brink. There was a lot of research. We traveled to Japan with our colleague Spencer Cohen, our research assistant, to talk to survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We, of course, talked to American officials on this topic. Bill really did the heavy lifting here, and I'll let him jump in. But we wanted to have a true, immersive multimedia experience because I think for many people, especially people who are younger, this was an issue from the 80s or 90s. You know, nuclear weapons was not on their radar in terms of subject matter and worries. People were more concerned with things like climate change and other existential threats. And so we wanted to change that. We wanted to create a public awareness on this topic. We felt the timing made sense. We launched in March because the United States specifically was beginning the presidential campaign in earnest. And we wanted to have it be on the radar for that campaign. I mean, it was a confluence of all these various threat vectors, buildup of the arsenals across the board, the saber rattling by Vladimir Putin and, and Kim Jong Un, which happens, you know, too frequently. And, you know, it just felt like there was a moment here to articulate what that meant for an entire generation that had grown up without that looming over their heads. As Katie says, growing up in the 80s, you know, there was a lot of, there were video games and there were movies and, you know, it was in the zeitgeist. This was a concern. And certainly, you know, earlier on in the Cold War, and I hear from readers all the time, you know, talking about duck and cover drills and, and these sorts of things, strange love and the various uh, films, but that did not happen. After the Soviet Union dissolved, 
we kind of stop talking about nuclear weapons in a constructive, meaningful way. People, if they could talk about it casually, that's no longer really the case. As certainly after the 9-11 attacks, the focus for national security became terrorism, and, and rightly so. And all the while, this threat loomed in the background. So we felt it was the right time to get this out in front of our readers, and we've had a good response uh, among them. And the series has been a hit, especially with younger generations who are grappling with a range of existential threats, including climate change and geopolitical instability. The series' success reflects a growing demand for media to address these critical issues with depth and urgency. Having a response from readers was really foremost in our minds. So we wanted all this subject matter, which is, you know, arcane and confounding, to kind of be demystified. So we wanted to speak in plain language about what the situation is. And we try to introduce various strategy and policies and explain them so that the average person will be able to comprehend it. Here I'm talking about sole authority comes to mind and, and no first use. People in the nuclear community know these terms and they throw them around fairly often, easily, but to the average person, it doesn't really mean much. So it was key to get that in plain language in front of people. As for the reaction, I, as I said before, I've had a lot of response from people of a certain age who remember the, the bad old days of the Cold War. But what's also been a rewarding is that I've heard from a lot of younger people. I've heard from high schoolers who I've FaceTimed with about their concerns and what these things mean. And, you know, we, we've had people, younger people write us as well, asking for... I've had some of them come visit me in the office. They're very enthusiastic. Right after the first piece launched, I happened to be in L.A. for the Oscars. And I was amazed by the young adults who had read the series. They had read it closely. They were high school students or college students. And they wanted to be engaged. And they wanted to understand what the stakes were here. And I think that, sorry, Bill, I didn't mean to step on you, but I think like the response here has been totally beyond our expectations. And part of that was a lot of the care that we put into when we were crafting the first pieces of the series. We had to think about things like, how do we get through to people in a way that's not just completely terrifying? This is a very scary reality. And we already live in an incredibly unstable world. There are two wars going on. The war in Gaza heightens the risk of nuclear use. And especially as we've seen, again, the saber rattling from a place like Iran. And so we wanted to make sure that we weren't immediately asking readers to tune out what we were talking about. We wanted to reach them. And Bill's beautiful storytelling and reporting was, I think, a really key element of that. I think the other thing that we've seen with each of the pieces that we've published is that other media outlets have had to follow. So we've broken news in almost every piece that Bill has written. And we've seen newsrooms have to also write about the news that he's written. And so that has been really enlightening. I'm currently at the DNC. And I think that one of our goals from the beginning, as I said, was to make this an issue in the current election. And the power of the New York Times platform, which is an incredible privilege, is that we do reach decision makers and we have put this issue on their radars. And I think that the advantage of doing it in opinion versus our news side, if you don't know, the New York Times news and opinion sections are separate. I report to A.G. Salzberger, the publisher, as does Joe Kahn, the executive editor. And the advantage of doing it in opinion is that we can use our reporting and our research and make strong recommendations in terms of policy. The only one thing I'd add to this is that these things are tied together, right? Because if more people are aware of this, it results in, this awareness results in, in, in uh, pressure on policy. And Katie and I have talked about, you know, you can go out, walk on any college campus and, you know, there'll be numerous environmental clubs and that sort of thing. But there are not virtually none when it comes to nuclear weapons. And, you know, raising that awareness and ringing that bell and making people aware of this and the, and the trajectory that we're currently on so that it can be avoided is very important to us. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. You know, in 1982, a million people were in the park, in Central Park, demanding change on this issue. It has 
been more quiet in the years since, and primarily because there were actual safety nets in place, and we were seeing a reduction of our arsenals. With the modernization that is being undertaken by the United States and China and Russia, the three main nuclear powers, as well as states like Iran and North Korea, this is a moment where, you know, that level of protest needs to be happening once again. The first article of the series was visually striking and resonated with a broader audience. In developing the series, the team focused on engaging Gen Z and building momentum, similar to the Freeze movement, recognizing that younger generations are visual learners and active on social media. They integrated these insights to enhance their coverage. You're absolutely right. You know, and that was something that from the beginning we were trying to think through and be really strategic about how to reach audiences. I think one of, so yes, we have an incredible visuals team in New York Times opinion. These pieces were crafted by dozens of people. Obviously, Bill was the lead writer, but there were editors, graphics editors, art designers, art directors, photographers. I mean, we have been blessed to have just extraordinary photography with each of these pieces. And all of that creativity was brought to bear in the visual presentation of these pieces. And of course, undergirded by research and reporting and all of the knowledge in Bill's brain. So we did that. We've been very, very purposeful about how we've presented the series on social media and tried to reach different audiences. We had a video by Emma Pike, who is a nuclear educator, as you probably know, had more than 10 million views on Twitter, which is astounding. And we will continue to do that as the series evolves. Much like the New York Times at the Brink series, which humanizes the impact of nuclear weapons, nuclear educator Emma Pike adopts a similar approach. Both of their social media success highlights that audiences connect strongly with stories that focus on personal experiences and human impact. This is a crucial insight for how nuclear issues should be covered, especially with an election on the horizon. The key to any story is making it personal and making people understand on a human level. It's always important to me to kind of tease out those stories that are the most impactful so that people feel it on a cellular level. The whole uh, Twitter X imbroglio with Emma, a lot of that is just mean people being trolls. I didn't really see any valid criticism there. You know, and the, and the other thing is, it's like, oh, well, if you, have a, if you have a different idea than the, you know, the orthodoxy of the, the nuclear priesthood, they're, they're coming for you. So that doesn't, it doesn't really surprise me because that's what, that's what Twitter's kind of become, or social media just in general. You know, on, on our stories, there are people that write in and, and have, you know, criticisms here or there, but I try to have, I, you know, I, I'm an even-handed journalist. You know, I, I don't overextend myself on, on certain points and, and things like that. I always back up what I say in print with data and, you know, personal stories. So I feel that we're on the right side of all these issues, of course. And if there's a meaningful, well well-stated argument against it, I'm open to having that discussion. I invite conversations like that because, you know, it's putting it in front of people in, in a constructive way. Yeah, I'll just add a couple of points. The first of which is that we have invited people to write in our opinion pages in disagree with, meant with us. We've had a couple of senators who have written pieces calling for more of a military buildup, including Senator Wicker. And so... I would say, first of all, we want to have a conversation about this. That's what we think is the most important point here. And again, we want to see it reflected in all the elections that are happening across the United States right now. I would say, in addition to that, I think that one of the things that has been the most revealing to me in learning more about this subject is how it's to the gatekeeper's advantage to have fewer people talking about this, right? And to have the circle of experts on this topic be small. In fact, it's, you know, nuclear weapons is in many ways one of the most undemocratic issues that there are. And, and I think that was really illustrated very well in Bill's reporting on sole authority. You know, the president in the United States has this unique power to launch these weapons. And there's not really a public 
dialogue about that. And especially over the last several months, as the nation has been gripped by a conversation about the two candidates' age, I'm obviously speaking of President Biden, and their capacity, the fact that those people are also, you know, have the ability to launch nuclear weapons without other inputs. It was just something we felt that there needed to be more conversation around. I'll just add one more point, which is, I think for me, and I, I think I'm speaking for Bill as well, when we went to Japan and heard the stories of the survivors there and what their lives were like, both on that horrific day, but also in the aftermath, the years that followed, the fact that they had the courage to speak out about that experience and the harrowing details that they told us, it felt very meaningful to make sure that their stories were front and center. And we heard that again. We interviewed dozens, and again, this is work that Bill was primarily doing, dozens of testing victims. And he's Bill has written so powerfully about the need to compensate those victims in the United States, but more far afield as well. And I think that having those stories front and center, it A, brings more people into the topic, and B, I think it just humanizes it. Nuclear weapons have a lot of victims, even if they're not used. And it's important that people understand that. If you're familiar with our podcast, you know we've explored the consequences of nuclear weapons on impacted communities, how the impacts are still being felt to this day by those impacted by the Trinity test to residents of the Marshall Islands who endured over 67 nuclear tests, as well as the communities nationwide suffering from illnesses linked to the nuclear weapons complex. It's crucial to highlight these stories and discussions about nuclear weapons as the human toll is often overlooked but essential to address, especially given the current debates about resuming nuclear testing. With the testing piece especially, there's this sort of, oh, well, you know, we tested weapons, but that was, you know, a half century ago. And, but the truth is, is that the effects are felt to this day. I mean, to, to levels that we don't really fully understand because the investment by our government and others into studying this issue has never materialized in a meaningful way. And, and a lot of these people are talking about maladies that they face in their day-to-day -day lives and fear for their children and are left without any firm answers. So when you hear stories like this, you know, you can't help but be uh, emotionally stirred. And as a writer, you know, I want to convey the feelings that I have to our readers so they understand what's at stake. Well, I think, you know, every single time we publish one of our pieces, we hear from lawmakers, we hear from policy experts, we hear from officials at the State Department, the National Security Agencies, the Pentagon. And so I think that while there's been a lot going on in this election. I think it's been, it's safe to say, it's, it's been really unprecedented in many ways. And that there are a lot of things on Americans' minds as we head into November. But we are seeing in Chicago, Kamala Harris presenting herself and defining herself for the American public. Foreign policy is going to have to be part of that and national security is going to have to be part of that conversation. And, you know, what I suspect is that, especially as we head into September and the debates between both the presidential candidates, but also the vice presidential candidates, this is going to be part of the public conversation. And I'm hopeful that they are pressed on this specific topic because, again, I think that, yes, we have the ongoing wars in Ukraine and Gaza, but there need to be more and more conversation and understanding of the military threat that China poses to the United States. And I don't want to suggest that, that we are going to go to war with China. That, that's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that China is building its arsenal right now, and it's something that is going to influence and color how the United States considers its own military funding, the way that where we send troops, where we send ships, where we build bases, so many different parts of this. And so it's really important, I think, that Vice President Harris 
and Governor Walz, as well as, of course, President Trump, who has spoken quite frequently about the fact that his uncle is a, a nuclear physicist at MIT, but we don't really have details yet. And that's what we're looking for. And we've invited both of the candidates to weigh in on our pages on this issue, but we really want it to be a matter of public debate. I just say that I think that our mission here since the beginning was to make this a matter of public debate. And I think that when we publish a story, it begins a conversation. It's the beginning of a conversation and, and we see that uh, taking place, not, not only in uh, other publications, but among government officials as well. And you know, the, the truth is, you know this all too well, to talk about nuclear weapons is not an easy conversation. I mean, first of all, it's the gravity of it. You know, Armageddon is not an easy thing to, it, we all have problems in our day-to-day -day lives. Oh, now I gotta worry about- Nuclear annihilation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So and then there's the technical hurdles as well of making it, people understand, people are afraid of it because they think, oh, this is too complicated for me to, to even waste my time on. We've had our work set out. We knew that at the beginning, and that's it's having it's easing that to make it more to make it easier to talk about. That's our goal, and I think we've time and again we've seen that be accomplished. Yeah, we've seen millions and millions of people engage on this topic and our you know our journalism around it, and I think you know we're just excited to keep doing that, and especially through the end of this year, but hopefully for many years to come. And speaking of the years to come, what's next for the series? We have a number of stories on the horizon and dealing with issues that you might expect. Some of these novel systems that we've discussed uh, earlier, certainly, you know, the DPRK and PRC expansion, as well as the certainty that we are going to have these weapons for uh, a generation or two or three. The conversation most of my life has been, virtually all of my life, you know, politicians have been talking about getting rid of nuclear weapons and disarmament. We don't have that uh, conversation any longer. In fact, we're hearing the exact opposite about the need to expand uh, arsenals. And this is the trajectory that we're on, and uh, we're doing our best to make people aware of that because we can talk about this in abstract terms. And in fact, that's mostly how the conversation has been for, for years and years is, you know, that's always five, 10 years away, but now we're living in a new nuclear age. And you don't need me to tell you that. The government, the uh, Biden administration officials have talked about this as well. And, you know, the prospect of either of these candidates, you know, and the, the baton that they're taking, both from this modernization effort, as well as, you know, what it looks like to develop new weapons and not test them. You know, that's going to be, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure. You've already seen Trump administration officials talk about the need to, to begin testing again and all of these things, these things that we thought we were, we lived behind, you know, that were behind us, that we thought were fixed now seem to be, the, the fissures seem to be uh, readily apparent. Yeah, I think it's too early to tell you how this series is going to end. I know that we want to continue to keep public attention on the issue and, and will through the rest of this year and into the next year and, and probably beyond. But I do think that as Bill mentions, one of the things that we're aiming for for the end of this year is whomever is elected in November really trying to set down a foundation for whatever policies that they undertake as, as president. Right. So we, yeah, I mean, obviously at the end of the year, you know, we do want to have a full body of work that we can, that's a menu of policy decisions that, that the next administration can take on. But also, you know, I've been writing about nuclear weapons for uh, many years. And although it won't be my full-time job as it has been over the, the last year, it's not something that I'm going to ever stop writing about. It's such an interesting, fascinating topic with the largest implications. And I feel duty-bound to articulate that the best way that I can. Yeah, and I'll just take a moment just to plug, obviously, the Times Opinion section. We are doing robust coverage of the elections. We're doing robust coverage of foreign policy and national security issues around this election. But also we're doing, you know, in-depth coverage. I am a former correspondent from in China, and so we're doing a lot of coverage around the future of the U.S.-China relations. And we are trying to keep all of these issues front and center as the election continues and the campaign continues. And so you'll find more in, in our pages. 
Thank you for listening to the first episode of this season titled The Nuclear Ballad, How the U.S. Election Shapes Nuclear Policy. We've delved deep into the complexities of nuclear policy and highlighted the crucial role the U.S. presidential election plays in shaping the future of global security. There are far-reaching consequences of decisions made by those in power, not just for the United States, but for the world as a whole. It's not our place to tell you who to vote for. But this season, we're here to provide you with the insights that matter, straight from the experts who know these critical policies. As the U.S. presidential election approaches, we'll help you grasp what is truly at stake when it comes to nuclear weapons. So stay tuned to our social media channels to get updates on this season. And to support our work on the podcast and in making our world safer from nuclear threat, visit plowshares.org. See you next episode.